let me say then, that 1348 years had already passed after the fruitful incarnation of the Son of God went into the distinguished city of Florence, more noble than any other Italian city, there came the deadly pestilence. The Black Death was the most devastating disease to ever pass through Europe. It decimated the population and completely changed the political, social, and religious landscape of the old continent. One prime example that showcases in detail the horror and after effects of the plague is the Republic of Florence. Not only did it provide an excellent environment for the disease to fester, but it also paved the way for the next big chapter in European history, the Renaissance. By 1348 AD, the Italian city-states and kingdoms were the economic powerhouses of the continent. Dealing in banking, art, and trade, cities like Venice, Florence, and Naples were expanding in order to accommodate the larger populations gathering in these economic centers. However, it was this very Italian urbanization that caused the Black Death to spread like wildfire throughout the region. The accounts of how the disease made its way to Italy vary. One theory is that it was brought by Genoese merchants fleeing the Mongol advance in the Crimea, while others claim that first contact was in Sicily due to its trade with the East. No matter the way it arrived, death and destruction were inevitable. Even though the city of Florence was not one of the first places in Italy to be hit by the plague, it was ill-prepared when it finally did arrive. This was because it already suffered a series of calamities in the previous years. Earthquakes had damaged Florence's Italian trade partners. The Florentian banks, the city's main source of wealth, had collapsed in 1346, creating an economic crisis. Northern Italy was suffering due to food shortages and flooding from the continuous rains of 1347. Finally, during all of this, the territorial disputes between city-states had not stopped, often leading to armed conflicts. In the end, the only thing the people of Florence could do was go out into the streets in the form of a public procession and plead to God to spare their city. However, a few short weeks later, the first signs of infection were starting to show. Thankfully, because Florence was not only a city of commerce, but also one that appreciated the fine arts, like literature. Many Florentians took to documenting their personal experiences of events during the outbreak, leaving us with the most detailed historical records of the tragedy. Giovanni Boccaccio, a Florentine humanist, provided us with objective eyewitness accounts. According to him, the plague came to Florence mainly in its bubonic form. The infected would have blood-filled buboes, and their bodies would exude an overwhelming body odor before finally succumbing to death three to six days later. Because of that, people learned early to avoid contact, not only with the infected themselves, but with anything belonging to them. Picasso writes, The rags of a poor man just dead had been thrown into the street. Two hogs came up, and after rooting amongst the rags and shaking them about in their mouths, in less than an hour, they both turned round and died on the spot. The administrative measures taken by the Republic were not that much different than the ones taken today by the world governments during the coronavirus outbreak. A special magistracy called the Sanita was formed to take over certain political powers in order to combat the sickness. Laws were created that organized the removal of major quantities of filth from the city, ensuring the maintenance of good health and restricting movement within the city. In addition, travelers were banned from entering Florence, and selling the belongings of the infected dead was prohibited. Alas, even with those measures, the mortality rate was still getting higher, while the medical practitioners of the city were clueless as to an effective cure, and the only thing they could offer was the relief of some symptoms. Notaries, confessors, Relations and doctors who visit the plague victims on entering their houses should open the windows 
and washed their hands with vinegar and rose water, and also their faces. It is also a good idea before entering the room to place in your mouth several cloves, and eat two slices of bread soaked in the best of wine, and then drink the rest of the wine. The majority of the population turned to the divine for protection, people quickly claiming the disease was the wrath of God. Many, feeling the end times were nigh, saw the plague as a punishment on Florence for man's sinful lifestyle created by the city's wealth. And not only the priests and clerics, but also educated intellectuals like the historian Giovanni Volani were preaching that the Black Death was cast upon the city to smite the sinners. Ironically, in 1350, Giovanni died from God's plague. Because of this, the people, in their despair and anger, started putting blame on different groups. The rich of the city blamed the poor, saying it was punishment for the petty crimes they committed. The poor, on the other hand, blamed the rich and their lavish sinful lifestyle. Christians blamed Muslims, Muslims blamed Christians, and both groups blamed the Jews. As a result, the Sanita issued new laws that locked the city's Jewish population in ghettos and prosecuted prostitution. Yet the death toll still increased. And soon no officials were even left to enforce the city's laws. All eyes were upon the church, but salvation did not come. The growing idea that death was inevitable dominated the mind of the Floritians, thus leaving everyone to fend for themselves. According to Boccaccio, the citizens' behavior was categorized in four ways. First, there were those that barricaded themselves inside their houses with their families, waiting in vain for the crisis to pass. And if just one family member became sick, then the whole family would most likely perish within a week. The second category were those who accepted the inevitable doom. And so, embracing their fate, they drank, ate, and celebrated the coming of the end times. However, there was another group that chose a method between the two. These continued eating normally, and would walk about outside with perfumes and nosegays. All three of these groups had one thing in common, though. They took great precautions to avoid the infected. And finally, there was the last group of people, those especially from the wealthy population, that chose to abandon the city, fleeing to the countryside. But even that was not completely safe. By the time the disease was subdued two years later, Florence's population was devastated. According to Matteo Villani, 60% of the city's total population, around 60,000 people, had died. The extreme decrease of population drastically changed Florence forever. The survivors' main concern was rebuilding and returning their city to its former glory as one of the biggest and wealthiest cities in Europe. Yet they found themselves in a different world, one full of religious, social, and economic changes. The feudal system was now inefficient. The few remaining farmers received increases in pay, making them able to purchase their freedom as serfs. In turn, they moved to better, unoccupied farming lands. The city's population of priests and monks also diminished, forcing the church to quickly appoint and train new ones this haste led to an inadequate and corrupted clergy, ultimately leading to the loss of the church's educational monopoly. The above, combined with an economic crisis in trade and a general increase in salaries, led to a redistribution of wealth and the decline of the nobility, usurped by a new merchant class. Florence was shaken to its core because of the Black Death. Yet, in hindsight, it was a bridge. Where one era ended, a new began, one that would come to change the course of human civilization forever. The survivors of the plague understood the fragility of human life, learning to savor and appreciate every single moment. New humanitarian movements began appearing among Florence's new philosophers and artists. Patronized by newly rich merchant families like the Medicis, they were able to create human-centric, not just religious-centered art. Florence suffered greatly due to the plague, 
Yet through the sheer determination and passion of its citizens, it came through a stronger, shining city, ready to embrace the Renaissance. Join us in our next video, where we'll take a deeper dive into plague-infested medieval Europe. Thanks for watching. Ah, uh, you. Want to learn how to escape infection? Then subscribe to the Cronanuts.